Wednesday, Yours, Anna. 5 January 1944. Dear Kitty, I have two things to confess to you today, which will take a long time, but I must tell someone, and you are the best one to tell, as I know that, come what may, you always keep a secret. The first is about Mummy. You know that I've grumbled a lot about Mummy, yet still tried to be nice to her again. Now it is suddenly clear to me what she lacks. Mummy herself has told us that she looked upon us more as her friends than her daughters. Now that is all very fine, but still a friend can't take a mother's place. I need my mother as an example which I can follow. I want to be able to respect her. I have the feeling that Margot thinks differently about these things and would never be able to understand what I've just told you. And Daddy avoids all arguments about Mummy. I imagine a mother as a woman who, in the first place, shows great tact, especially toward her children when they reach our age. And who does not laugh at me if I cry about something, not pain, but other things, like Mom's does? One thing, which perhaps may seem rather fatuous, I have never forgiven her. It was on a day that I had to go to the dentist. Mummy and Margot were going to come with me and agreed that I should take my bicycle. When we had finished at the dentist and were outside again, Margot and Mummy told me that they were going into the town to look at something or buy something. I don't remember exactly what. I wanted to go too, but was not allowed to as I had my bicycle with me. Tears of rage sprang into my eyes, and Mummy and Margot began laughing at me. Then I became so furious that I stuck my tongue out at them in the street, just as an old woman happened to pass by, who looked very shocked. I rode home on my bicycle, and I know I cried for a long time. It is queer that the wound that Mummy made then still burns when I think of how angry I was that afternoon. The second is something that is very difficult to tell you because it is about myself. Yesterday, I read an article about blushing by Sis Heister. This article might have been addressed to me personally. Although I don't blush very easily, the other things in it certainly all fit me. She writes roughly something like this, that a girl in the years of puberty becomes quiet within and begins to think about the wonders that are happening to her body. I experience that too, and that is why I get the feeling lately of being embarrassed about Margot, Mummy, and Daddy. Funnily enough, Margot, who is much more shy than I am, isn't at all embarrassed. I think what is happening to me is so wonderful— and not only what can be seen on my body, but all that is taking place inside. I never discuss myself or any of these things with anybody. That is why I have to talk to myself about them. Each time I have a period, and that has only been three times, I have the feeling that in spite of all the pain, unpleasantness, and nastiness, I have a sweet secret, and that is why, although it is nothing but a nuisance to me in a way, I always long for the time that I should feel that Sis secret Heister within also again. writes that girls of this age don't feel quite certain of themselves and discover that they themselves are individuals with ideas, thoughts, and habits. After I came here when I was just 14, I began to think about myself sooner than most girls and to know that I am a person. Sometimes when I lie in bed at night, I have a terrible desire to feel my breasts and to listen to the quiet rhythmic beat of my heart. I already had these kinds of feelings subconsciously before I came here, because I remember that once when I slept with a girlfriend, I had a strong desire to kiss her, and that I did so. I could not help being terribly inquisitive over her body, for she had always kept it hidden from me. I asked her whether, as proof of our friendship, we should feel one another's breasts, but she refused. I go into ecstasies every time I see the naked figure of a woman, such as Venus, for example, it strikes me as so wonderful and exquisite that I have difficulty in stopping the tears rolling down my cheeks. If only I had a girlfriend. Yours, Anna. Thursday, 6 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, my longing to talk to someone became so intense that somehow or other I took it into my head to choose Pater. Sometimes, if I've been upstairs into Pater's room during the day... It always struck me as very snug, but because Pater is so retiring and one would never turn anyone out who became a nuisance, I never dared stay long, because I was afraid he might think me a bore. 
I tried to think of an excuse to stay in his room and get him talking without it being too noticeable, and my chance came yesterday. Peter has a mania for crossword puzzles at the moment and hardly does anything else. I helped him with them, and we soon sat opposite each other at his little table, he on the chair and me on the divan. It gave me a queer feeling each time I looked into his deep blue eyes, and he sat there with that mysterious laugh playing round his lips. I was able to read his inward thoughts. I could see on his face that look of helplessness and uncertainty as how to behave, and at the same time a trace of his sense of manhood. I noticed his shy manner, and it made me feel very gentle. I couldn't refrain from meeting those dark eyes again and again, and with my whole heart I almost beseeched him, Oh, tell me, what is going on inside you? Oh, can't you look beyond this ridiculous chatter? But the evening passed and nothing happened, except that I told him about blushing, naturally not what I have written, but just so that he would become more sure of himself as he grew older. When I lay in bed and thought over the whole situation, I found it far from encouraging, and the idea that I should beg for Pater's patronage was simply repellent. One can do a lot to satisfy one's longings, which certainly sticks out in my case, for I have made up my mind to go and sit with Pater more often and to get him talking somehow or other. Whatever you do, don't think I'm in love with Pater, not a bit of it. If the Von Dons had had a daughter instead of a son, I should have tried to make I friends with her I woke at about too. five to seven this morning and knew at once, quite positively, what I had dreamed. I sat on a chair and opposite me sat Pater, Vessel. We were looking together at a book of drawings by Mary Boss. The dream was so vivid that I can still partly remember the drawings. But that was not all. The dream went on. Suddenly, Pater's eyes met mine, and I looked into those fine, velvet-brown eyes for a long time. Then Pater said very softly, If I had only known, I would have come to you long before. I turned around brusquely because the emotion was too much for me. And after that I felt a soft and, oh, such a cool, kind cheek against mine, and it felt so good, so good. I awoke at this point, while I could still feel his cheek against mine, and felt his brown eyes looking deep into my heart, so deep that there he read how much I had loved him, and how much I still love him. Tears sprang into my eyes once more, and I was very sad that I had lost him again, but at the same time glad because it made me feel quite certain that Pater was still the chosen one. It is strange that I should often see such vivid images in my dreams here. First, I saw Grandma so clearly one night that I could even distinguish her thick, soft, wrinkled, velvety skin. Footnote. Grandma is grandmother on father's side, granny on mother's side. Then Granny appeared as a guardian angel, then followed Lee's, who seems to be a symbol to me of all the sufferings of all my girlfriends and all Jews. When I pray for her, I pray for all Jews and all those in need. And now Pater, my darling Pater, never before have I had such a clear picture of him in my mind. I don't need a photo of him. I can see him before my eyes and oh so well. Yours, Anna. Friday, 7 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, what a silly ass I am. I am quite forgetting that I have never told you the history of myself and all my boyfriends. When I was quite small, I was even still at a kindergarten, I became attached to Carol Sampson. He had lost his father, and he and his mother lived with an aunt. One of Carol's cousins, Robbie, was a slender, good-looking dark boy, who aroused more admiration than the little humorous fellow, Carol, but looks did not count with me, and I was very fond of Carol for years. We used to be together a lot for quite a long time, but for the rest, my love was unreturned. Then Pater crossed my path, and in my childish way I really fell in love. He liked me very much, too, and we were inseparable for one whole summer. I can still remember us walking hand in hand through the streets together, he in a cotton-white suit and me in a short summer dress, at the end of the summer holidays, he went into the first form of the high school, and I into the sixth form of the lower school. He used to meet me from school, and vice versa, I would meet him. Pater was a very good-looking boy, tall, handsome, and slim, with an earnest, calm, intelligent face. He had dark hair and wonderful brown eyes, 
ruddy cheeks and a pointed nose. I was mad about his laugh above I all when he looked so for the holidays. When I returned, Pater had in the meantime moved, and a much older boy lived in the same house. He apparently drew Pater's attention to the fact that I was a childish little imp, and Pater gave me up. I adored him so that I didn't want to face the truth. I tried to hold on to him until it dawned on me that if I went on running after him, I should soon get the name of being boy-mad. The years passed. Pater went around with girls of his own age and didn't even think of saying hello to me anymore. But I couldn't forget him. I went to the Jewish secondary school. Lots of boys in our class were keen on me. I thought it was fun, felt honored, but was otherwise quite untouched. Then later on, Harry was mad about me, but, as I've already told you, I never fell in love again. There is a saying, time heals all wounds, and so it was with me. I imagined that I had forgotten Pater, and that I didn't like him a bit anymore. The memory of him, however, lived so strongly in my subconscious mind that I admitted to myself sometimes I was jealous of the other girls, and that was why I didn't like him anymore. This morning I knew that nothing has changed. On the contrary, as I grew older and more mature, my love grew with me. I can quite understand now that Pater thought me childish, and yet it still hurt that he had so completely forgotten me. His face was shown so clearly to me, and now I know that no one else could remain with me like he does. I am completely upset by the dream. When Daddy kissed me this morning, I could have cried out, Oh, if only you were Pater. I think of him all the time, and I keep repeating to myself the whole day, Oh, Pater, darling, darling Pater. Who can help me now? I must live on and pray to God that he will let Pater cross my path when I come out of here, and that when he reads the love in my eyes, he will say, Oh, Anna, if I had only known, I would have come to you long before. I saw my face in the mirror, and it looks quite different. My eyes look so clear and deep. My cheeks are pink, which they haven't been for weeks. My mouth is much softer. I look as if I am happy, and yet there is something so sad in my expression that my smile slips away from my lips as soon as it has come. I'm not happy, because I might know that Pater's thoughts are not with me. And yet I still feel his wonderful eyes upon me and his cool, soft cheek against mine. Oh, Patel, Patel, how will I ever free myself of your image? Wouldn't any other in your place be a miserable substitute? I love you, and with such a great love that it can't grow in my heart any more, but has to leap out into the open and suddenly manifest itself in such a devastating way. A week ago, even yesterday, if anyone had asked me, which of your friends do you consider would be the most suitable to marry? I would have answered, I don't know. But now I would cry Patel, because I love him with all my heart and soul. I give myself completely. But one thing, he may touch my face, but no more. Once when we spoke about sex, Daddy told me that I couldn't possibly understand the longing yet. I always knew that I did understand it, and now I understand it fully. Nothing is so beloved to me now as he, my Patel. Wednesday, yours, 12 January, 1944. Dear Kitty, Ellie has been back a fortnight. Miep and Hank were away from their work for two days. They both had tummy upsets. I have a craze for dancing and ballet at the moment and practice dance steps every evening diligently. I have made a super modern dance frock from a light blue petticoat edged with lace belonging to Mansa. A ribbon is threaded through round the top and ties in a bow in the center, and a pink corded ribbon completes the creation. I tried in vain to convert my gym shoes into real ballet shoes. My stiff limbs are well on the way to becoming supple again like they used to be. One terrific exercise is to sit on the floor, hold a heel in each hand, and then lift both legs up in the air. I have to have a cushion under me, otherwise my poor little behind has a rough time. Everyone here is reading the book Cloudless Morn. Mummy thought it exceptionally good. There are a lot of youth problems in it. I thought to myself rather ironically, take a bit more trouble with your own young people first. I believe Mummy thinks there could be no better relationship between parents and their children, and that no one could take a greater interest in their children's lives than she. 
but quite definitely she only looks at Margot, who I don't think ever had such problems and thoughts as I do. Still, I wouldn't dream of pointing out to Mummy that, in the case of her daughters, it isn't at all as she imagines, because she would be utterly amazed and wouldn't know how to change anyway. I want to save her the unhappiness it would cause her, especially as I know that, for me, everything would remain the same anyway. Mummy certainly feels that Margot loves her much more than I do, but she thinks that this just goes in phases. Margot has grown so sweet. She seems quite different from what she used to be, isn't nearly so catty these days, and is becoming a real friend. Nor does she any longer regard me as a little kid who counts for nothing. I have an odd way of sometimes, as it were, being able to see myself through someone else's eyes. Then I view the affairs of a certain Anna at my ease, and browse through the pages of her life as if she were a stranger. Before we came here, when I didn't think about things as much as I do now, I used at times to have the feeling that I didn't belong to Mansa, Pym, and Margot, and that I would always be a bit of an outsider. Sometimes I used to pretend I was an orphan, until I reproached and punished myself, telling myself it was all my own fault that I played this self-pitying role when I was really so fortunate. Then came the time that I used to force myself to be friendly. Every morning, as soon as someone came downstairs, I hoped that it would be Mummy who would say good morning to me. I greeted her warmly because I really longed for her to look lovingly at me. Then she made some remark or other that seemed unfriendly, and I would go off to school, again feeling thoroughly disheartened. On the way home, I would make excuses for her because she had so many worries. Arrive home very cheerful, chatter nineteen to the dozen, until I began repeating myself and left the room wearing a pensive expression, my satchel under my arm. Sometimes I decided to remain cross, but when I came home from school I always had so much news that my resolutions were gone with the wind, and Mummy, whatever she might be doing, had to lend an ear to all my adventures. Then the time came once more when I didn't listen for footsteps on the staircase any longer, and at night my pillow was wet with tears. Everything grew much worse at that point. Enfin, you know all about it. Now God has sent me a helper, Peter. I just clasp my pendant, kiss it, and think to myself, what do I care about the lot of them? Peter belongs to me, and no one knows anything about it. This way I can get over all the snubs I receive. Who would ever think that so much can go on in the soul of a young girl?' 